But picking up with the mean free path, uh, doo -doo, sorry, which again is the measure, the measure of the attenuation uh, of ionizing photons by the intergalactic medium, Cosmo cosmologically. Uh, it's important, one of its great importance is summarized here in equation 36, which shows the relationship between the mean intensity uh, radiation field of the UV background with the <coughs> uh, emissivity, epsilon, of ionizing sources in the universe, quasars, galaxies, and the like. And then it's modulated, as I've said, by this uh, quantity of the mean free path. Uh, can't really be predicted from first principles, say, in, in cosmological simulations of the IGM. So uh, one requires estimates from uh, the data to uh, uh, be able to evaluate uh, something like equation 36. The traditional approach was to use uh, the frequency distribution that we worked hard to derive yesterday, I guess. Um, to estimate the effective opacity of the line limit, as I'll show in a moment, and then use that to uh, infer the mean free path. So again, the effective opacity now from the alignment continuum is the uh, opacity of the photon with, uh, that has an energy uh, beyond the uh, alignment limit experiences as it travels through the universe. Uh, in contrast to the alignment alpha effective opacity, uh, this is a uh, continuum opacity, so uh, the distance it travels uh, is uh, one of the key quantities here to the calculation. Uh, as I cartooned right before the break, um, the uh, photons emitted by the source, the distant quasar, get redshifted and experience this th opacity until they are redshifted to one Rydberg, uh, one Rydberg in energy, at which point uh, they go beyond or go less than one Rydberg in energy and no longer uh, suffer the continuum opacity. Um, so that's what I mean by uh, the distance traveled, and you can calculate the redshift that, that, that they will hit uh, the one would bring quite simply from uh, the quasar's uh, emission and uh, the uh, uh, rest frame frequency of the source, of the photon at the source. So um, to derive it from, this, uh, from our frequency distribution, we recognize that the attenuation from the line of continuum opacity for an absorption line with uh, a complexity of NH1 is just one minus e to the minus tau, where tau now is uh, the H1 column density times the cross-section with the frequency dependence that we derived uh, earlier today. And then uh, we weight each of those absorption lines just by our uh, frequency distribution. And if we allow for the frequency dependence that we derived for the photoionization cross-section, you get an equation that looks like this. And so we're summing up the attenuation of each line weighted by the frequency of each line and doing that calculation from the source uh, to the redshift at which that photon is no longer uh, above one Rydberg in energy. Okay. So that can be evaluated and, and as I said traditionally it was to estimate this effective um, Lyman limit opacity. Here's a, an example of it. Um, starting at a source at a redshift 3.5, and as that s photon travels towards us, so going lower in redshift towards redshift zero, here's the effective opacity, and it reaches one uh, at a delta Z of about 0.3, which is probably about 100 megaparsecs at a redshift of, uh, at this redshift, maybe a little bit less. Um, You can take the differential of that quantity, tau effective, and plot it as a function of log column density to see what uh, gas is contributing the most to the opacity. Uh, and it's roughly half the opacity comes from uh, uh, absorption uh, systems that have an, uh, an opacity at the Lyman limit of order one, and about half of that uh, opacity comes from uh, systems that are highly opaque to the ionizing radiation. Uh, with opacities even exceeding 100. The problem with this technique really lies here, well, actually lies all through here. Uh, the frequency distribution uh, previously has, well, really has never been well measured over these column densities. Uh, I'll remind you again, that's the, exactly the uh, region of the saturated portion of the curve of growth where we lose sensitivity to the H1 column densities. So this is the region where you'd expect to have the least sensitivity, and we still do have the least sensitivity uh, to measuring such lines. And so this estimation was uncertain by at least a factor of a few uh, based on just trying to sum up the, uh, the frequency columns, uh, sum up the evaluation I showed uh, here. Uh, as a result, um, we've taken a new uh, approach, to, to, uh, a new methodology towards estimating this mean free path, which I was cartooning at the end 
of my first talk that today. Uh, <clears throat> here's, the here's the example for just one quasar. Uh, you can ask, where, does the, where do the photons from that quasar exhibit uh, e to the minus 1 attenuation for this one, for this one quasar? It works out to be about 30 megaparsecs. Uh, but we're interested in the average quantity, the average opacity of the intergalactic medium. So to do this, uh, you would like to take hundreds or thousands of such quasars and assess that, uh, that opacity in each one and average them all up. Uh, unfortunately, the number of data where you could actually measure this precisely uh, on a one-by-one -one basis is small. Um, I can, uh, can, uh, it's too dark. Um, so we uh, resort to averaging the spectra. And uh, the idea here is to visualize it this way. <coughs> um, I have 100 quasar spectra. I normalize the flux so that each one contributes the same, because I'm interested in the average quantity of the universe, not, which should not depend on the brightness of the quasar. Normalize the flux from each of those quasars. And now I have packets of photons from all those hundreds of quasars. I can put all those ionizing photons together and look for the mean uh, uh, decrement in the flux as a function of distance from the quasars. Take all the quasars, normalize their flux so that each one contributes the same. Now I have all, this, I have all these packets of photons from my uh, ionizing sources, from my quasars, and I look for uh, the redshift at which uh, I experience a e to the minus 1 attenuation. That's what's uh, diagrammed here. So here's a uh, average first flux normalized and then average spectrum of about 150 quasars at a redshift of 4. And uh, we see this roll off in the average flux with, as you go below the Lyman limit. Uh, I'll remind you that uh, the absorption out here is due to Lyman series ab absorption. This is dominated uh, by the Lyman continuum opacity. And it's, uh, you know, in, this, in the simplest form, one would just measure the flux here at the Lyman limit and identify where you suffer an e to the minus 1 attenuation. And that uh, delta lambda corresponds to a delta redshift, corresponds to a uh, physical distance, which we uh, now uh, measure the mean free path from. Uh, that would, that's an approach where you just uh, measure the flux at, the, at this point. This point would ignore all these pixels, so we take a little bit more sophisticated approach and model uh, that, uh, that, uh, that flux decrement or that flux evolution as a simple opacity. I think I'll just jump through that. Um, but you get uh, to leverage all the pixels by uh, adopting a very simple op opacity model that we do. And this shows the fit of that, uh, the comparison of those models, the colored curves to the stack spectra ranging from, I think, about a ratio of four to four and a half. In this diagram, uh, I think you'll agree it's a good model of data. And from each one of these uh, uh, combined spectra, we can get a, get a unique uh, estimation of the mapping path. And so, and so uh, that's going to apply to quasars now uh, at a range of redshifts. Red red this is HST data. data. Uh, a stack of about 50 quasars with three, three uh, grism. grism. And the uh, model, uh, uh, again, the roll off here, below 912 angst, which is dominated by uh, the uh, uh, IGM continuum, continuum opacity. Uh, uh, shows uh, results from higher, higher redshifts, probably got to five. 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 Uh, but uh, with the mean free passage starts to get very short, as the whole well tends to be 10 megaparsecs. And again, and model minus by, by this uh, uh, simple opacity, opacity term. Putting that together, together, we uh, find, find this, this, which is the mean free path, path, path across, across, about, about, no, no, across, across a few years. We have not been able to get to make any estimates below it too. And it's well modeled by, again, one puts the ROA. The values that we covered are actually, actually about, about to factor two, two uh, higher, higher, higher than, than what was previously said. Previous 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 from that, summing uh, 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 up from the three distribution, distribution um, um, which means that uh, one, one needs fewer resources, resources, resources to uh, keep the universe ionized to generate the UV back on that new techniques. It's uh, one can extrapolate, one can extrapolate, extrapolate brazenly, brazenly, if you will, uh, what the, uh, the APP path, path is out, is out six six and beyond, beyond, you can see the redshift works where we think we're approaching the end of, end of a hundred hydrogenization. It's still still uh, several uh, parts of our sec, I'm the virus of our sec, so no indication. indication. Uh, um, if, if, if ionization were to uh, have ended there, uh, there uh, it would have to be brought up uh, evolution evolution from what would be. Would be a mean free path, path, path of, of zero, zero megaparsecs to uh, uh, say six, six megaparsecs. 
and we can, and we can uh, uh, ask the question, ask the question at, what, at what point does this uh, uh, mean to be uh, now uh, approach the size of the, 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 the horizon, horizon. and, and uh, that's, 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 that's called the breakthrough register. Break break that, 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 that stage when the mean to be is uh, the size uh, of the cosmic horizon. horizon. And every source, you can see every other horizon source, and to the earth order, the IGN no longer attenuates the radiation field. And uh, yeah, we have yeah, static yeah, patterns at around a edge of 1.66 for this breakthrough. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the mean uh, path, path is significantly larger than the from older uh, uh, from the models, uh, models of uh, FNH1. And, and, and now we've actually inverted the situation. We use this mean to be path to generate what is our current estimation or current model for the full frequency distribution. Uh, here's the mean free path constraint. Here's the incidence of line limit systems constraint that uh, worked out this morning. Here's a constraint from the effective line alpha capacity, which I'm pressed upon you. very been very well measured. And this black curve then is this crazy who meets spline that I mentioned yesterday. Uh, the evaluation of the frequency distribution of a shift uh, two and a half across uh, 10 orders of magnitude in the H1 problem. The other applica another another application, application of having measured this rather precisely is the mean free path is uh, one can use it to correct uh, measurements of the ionization and escape fraction for galaxies. Uh, we may define the escape fraction as the observed flux below the line and limit uh, relative to the intrinsic uh, flux uh, at the line and limit of that galaxy or quasar or whatever source you wish to make uh, an estimate of the escape fraction of. But this uh, observed uh, flux below at the Lyman limit is, has been attenuated by the IGM. If, for example, you perform an experiment where you take a 100 angstrom filter just bluered of a uh, redshift uh, 3.5 galaxies Lyman limit, that cover, that'll cover something like 0.1 in delta Z. And uh, I worked out that the average effective opacity from the IGM will be uh, about 0.25 at this redshift, or 30% correction, which is modest. But as I, we just saw, this mean free path uh, is evolving like uh, 1 plus z to the f fifth power. So by a redshift of 4, even 5, this becomes a, a very significant correction to uh, the estimation. All right, a few more words on, on line and limit systems. We've heard quite a bit this week already about uh, cold accreting gas. Um, there were early efforts to model the distribution of optically thick gas in, in numerical simulations, which um, were woefully uh, short of matching the, abs uh, matching the data. Uh, those early simulations were resolution and, and physics limited, in particular, uh, very simple treatments of radiative transfer. Um, in the meantime, uh, this notion of uh, accreting cold gas onto galaxies has arisen, uh, and if not dominated, some of the discussions of galaxy formation at, at Redshift 2. And uh, while it's again difficult to do this, uh, to do hydrodynamically resolve such accretion and difficult for sure to uh, solve the radiative transfer that's necessary to predict how much atomic gas would be in, this, uh, in these cool flows, cold flows that are of order 10 to the 4 Kelvin. Nevertheless, people have made attempts and I'm showing you one example from uh, Fumagalli, I'll blow that up, uh, of a cold stream, whatever you want to call this, cold flow, uh, creating onto a central galaxy. And uh, if you can't see it from the back, well, you probably can. Anything that's really not uh, especially dark here is optically thick to the Lyman limit. So uh, the predictions, at least from this model, which do inc it did include um, a Monte Carlo treatment of radiative transfer for the ionizing photons, is that uh, indeed uh, quite a, a sig significant fraction of the cold flow would be optically thick to uh, at the Lyman limit and then would give rise to Lyman limit system absorption. So in contrast to <coughs> predictions from uh, predictions for the emission of Lyman alpha radiation from such flows, which are, as I think Mark emphasized, are very sensitive to the uh, assumed temperature or the estimated temperature in the simulation. Here, uh, the dominant uncertainty is, is the radiative transfer. And uh, I, I believe, well, I'm sure it's much less sensitive. That, that sensitivity is much less than trying to really figure out the temperature of this gas, which would give you the H1, sorry, the Lyman alpha emission. <clears throat> so the prediction is that indeed cold flow should give rise to uh, a, a substantial fraction or a fraction of the optically thick gas that we're observing along the quasar sight lines. The further prediction is that the, the gas should have a low metallicity. 
So this is now the same stream, but with Metallicity uh, cartooned or color coded. And uh, most of the material will be around a hundredth of solar. The gas in close to the galaxy, of course, would be, could be enriched by uh, the stars and star formation within that system. So the search has been on to find metal poor uh, optically thick gas. It's actually quite straightforward. Um, but I would say that connecting and identifying such gas uh, has been achieved, but then connecting it back to this picture that it's a cold flow onto a central galaxy is, is kind of where the, the state of the field is at. And uh, I'll show you some future slide on that tomorrow. <coughs> uh, and I've actually already pointed out, I'll, I'll reemphasize that uh, these same simulations, uh, well, you can see just by eye that the cross section of such material the covering fraction of such material is small. You know, draw a circle here. The covering fraction of that optically thick gas in a, in a dark matter halo is modest, say 10 to 20%. Uh, if you then uh, do perform the calculation I, I had shown earlier today of what the total incidence would be from dark matter halos, it is uh, significantly less than what we uh, observe in the data. So it cannot be that uh, cold flows are the entire, uh, give you rise to the entire population of optically thick gas. They certainly would contribute, but not dominate. All right, uh, I think I'll leave it there. I put in the notes some description of metal enrichment, but uh, you can prove that on yourself. I think maybe the one takeaway take point is uh, the metal enrichment within these optically thick systems are really ex exhibit the extreme of metal enrichment from supersolar metallicities to nearly primordial. Okay, so that finished uh, description of optically thick line limit systems. And now a presentation on damp line alpha systems, which are the extrema of H1 absorption and kind of complete our census, if you will, of uh, H1, of what is absorbing uh, H1 lyman alpha in the universe. <clears throat> uh, the study of DLAs, as we call them, was pioneered by a wolf who was searching for uh, hydrogen gas, neutral hydrogen gas in distant galaxies. Uh, in the early 80s and 70s even. Uh, his approach uh, was first to use hydrogen, to search for hydrogen to be the 21 centimeter absorption line. Um, that's turned out to be very challenging, uh, very challenging. So he gave up and instead pursued our favorite Lyman alpha line. Um, there's an obvious link uh, between galaxies and uh, these very high H1 com densities. We see that in the local universe. Um, I'm plotting here uh, the H1 21 centimeter map uh, of this galaxy, I forget the name, NGC, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what you uh, find in the local universe is that all the uh, com high common density H1 gas uh, is associated with luminous galaxies with a few exceptions. So uh, it's natural to, to associate uh, what we define as a damp Lyman alpha system with uh, neutral hydrogen gas in galaxies, although I'll, when I finish, I'll finish this presentation with um, describing some of the challenges that have been found, or the, the, some of the challenges that have been, uh, have been along the way in establishing that connection. Sticking with just the hydrogen absorption, uh, we define, st strictly speaking, a damp Lyman alpha system as, uh, as I said, the extrema of the H1 uh, com densities, specifically anything exceeding 2 times 10 to 20. That choice was somewhat arbitrary. It was motivated by uh, 21 centimeter maps like these of, of local galaxies, which showed um, that the uh, H1 gas had extended out to contours of that order, 10 to the 20 particles per square centimeters. <clears throat> so it's physically motivated, but somewhat arbitrary choice. Nevertheless, it's what we stick with. Um, and uh, we've looked a little bit at uh, the damp Lyman alpha profile in the earlier lectures, but here is a set of idealized profiles running from that 2 times 10 to the 20 uh, boundary up to, say, 10 to the 22, some of the highest common densities we've seen in H1 in the universe. And you're seeing, again, the, the Lorentzian wings uh, show, their, uh, show their power as we uh, increase the overall column density. All the Doppler broadening, I'll remind you, would be lost, is lost within this core here. There's no, uh, really no contribution from the Doppler broadening to the uh, idealized profiles or the measured profiles. Hmm. So uh, from the data standpoint, uh, uh, any profile in a DLA is, is, is constrained by, or is, is really parameterized by two uh, numbers, the redshift, which gives the centroid of the profile, and, 
and the H1 COM density. Uh, I was going to torture you, show you some more of the underbelly of absorption line research by fitting by hand a damp laminoff off system. I think I won't. Um, but if you're interested, uh, come pester me over a beer, a, a beer night before dinner, and I'll show you some of that process. Uh, we've, we mentioned this a few times. Let me illustrate it. Uh, the Lorentzian is not a perfect or proper description or per perfectly accurate, may say it that way, description of the line profile out in the uh, wings of the line profile. Um, Lee et al. has nicely derived the lowest order of perturbations uh, to the Lorentzian from second order time dependent perturbation theory. <clears throat> the effects are small, but uh, at a high enough calm density, they are, in principle at least, measurable. Um, here, I compared just the strict Lorentzian, which is in black, with this uh, corrected, first order corrected uh, line profile. And it's asymmetric now about line center. There's uh, a higher opacity uh, on the red wing, a lower opacity on the blue wing from the from Lorentzian. And the most obvious effect uh, this could have or could be measured in the data would be a, a small of order, maybe 100 kilometers per second shift in the line centroid. And, I think it'd be nice to demonstrate this in the real universe. Um, and I think there are even some uh, potential uh, cases one could do that, just as a nice test of the quantum mechanics. But uh, that effect is, is small enough that at least the surveys that have been taken in place today are, are not sensitive to it. Can you distinguish that effect from errors? Uh, not trivially. So no, as I say, it's not been done yet. <laughs> um, there are profiles with, there are, there's gas in the universe probes, say by GRB afterglows, I've got a small section in the end that I'm not sure I'll get to, that have uh, H1 com densities that are even 22.7, okay? And I think the approach I would, would like to use, again, is it should be just the, the most obvious thing you're gonna fit towards is the centroid, and I would compare the centroid I'd get from Lyman Alpha with that, that you could get from the higher order lines of the Lyman series, Lyman beta, Lyman gamma. And yes, continuum can matter. Um, but uh, I think there's a fighting chance, at least at the very highest comp densities. But hasn't been done. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I think it's worth a shot. Is, a, is 100 a good kilometer per second? That's feasible, right? Now in, in, in oh, yeah, 100 kilometers per second is easy, but she raises, you know, she's raised a good point that uh, I can, since I have to uh, normalize the spectrum, the continuum normalize the spectrum. If I've got a shape to that continuum, which you do, and I've tilted that incorrectly, then I can get an asymmetry here that's maybe comparable. Yeah. Uh, an advantage of using gamma ray bursts in this case is that their uh, parallel spectra are pretty well behaved, say, compared to a quasar, so you also would have a fighting chance. But that said, yet to be done. Mm -hmm. Good question. So surveying uh, this gas, uh, it was launched, as I said, by Art Wolf in the uh, mid-80s. He used four-meter class telescopes and uh, relatively or modest dispersion, low, lowish signal noise data, but that's more than sufficient to resolve this very, these very broad damping wings. And uh, they, of course, have very high equivalence as well, so this high signal noise is not really required either. Um, we gen generate a sensitivity function, this G of Z, that I introduced for the Lyme limb systems as well, uh, which describes the survey path. Um, unlike the Lyme and limit systems, that, that sensitivity function doesn't truncate when you hit, when you, when you see a DLA, that is, one DLA doesn't preclude the discovery of a second one along any given sight line. Um, here is the sensitivity function for the Sloan survey, um, or at least the DR3 to Sloan survey, and just to press upon you that, uh, uh, two points. One, uh, we are, there are now thousands of quasars in play at these redshifts, thanks to the, the large uh, spectroscopic surveys, and it was roughly an order of magnitude increase over what was the best done at the time from four-meter class telescopes, which was this kind of green line here. Uh, even going further to you know, Sloan on steroids as boss, and you're now in the regime where 10,000 quasars uh, can be surveyed uh, for the H1 gas. So uh, not surprising that the statistics have gotten pretty good. Um, I'll skip over that. Uh, somewhat ironically, uh, the work at low redshift is, is much poorer, um, despite being closer in the universe. Uh, it's because you have two hits working against you. One, you have to use a UV space telescope, so getting the number of sight lines, uh, even the entire HST archive, which is being shown here, you're talking about only 100 quasars. 
And the incidence, uh, as you'll see in a moment, is considerably smaller at lower redshift. So you need, you need more sight lines even just to get more, enough systems to, to do the analysis, but you have less data just because you're, you're working in the ultraviolet. So that's, that's a regime where I think uh, very quickly, even as hard as it is, 21 centimeter will uh, take over. Uh, let me mention a few biases to such surveys. Uh, the biggest bugaboo, for sure, is dust, which uh, we've been hearing about in the case of, of Limanoff emission. Uh, it also can affect us in Limanoff absorption because uh, the dust within this H1 gas um, can, will, or can at least, obscure at the background source, the quasar. Uh, what's being plotted here is the AV, the extinction, is a function of, uh, of a metal column density. It's kind of a funny way of, of describing it, but uh, as I put it here in the notes, uh, a, uh, a gas, a solar metallicity gas with Milky Way dust and an H1 com density of 10 to 21 will suffer an AV extinction of about one. Uh, that's pretty large already, especially since we are doing this experiment in the rest frame UV. Uh, and so there's always the concern, uh, even a high redshift where the metal cities are lower, that uh, we, uh, with this experiment, are missing some of the very highest column density gas because of uh, obscuration of, of dust within that system. Hasn't been shown to be a problem, but it's always one that's in the back of our, uh, of our head. In fact, it's been tested, and so far it's, it's not clear. It is an issue, but nevertheless uh, worth mentioning. Uh, if, the, if the gas is hosted by a massive galaxy that can lens the background quasar, that's been uh, assessed, and there's also some kind of technical issues associated with the data that I, that I wouldn't bother. Okay, so um, the estimator for the BIND evaluation is the same as we've used before, number of systems in some, now I'm using delta X instead of delta Z interval, and some column density interval. Uh, in the early days, it was tough just to get a few tens of DLAs, but you know, there was some indication that, uh, well, clearly indication that as you increased the column density, the frequency distribution went down, no surprise. Uh, perhaps that was, could be well modeled by a single power law. Um, the problem really, or what was obvious that, that this couldn't be the complete picture is that the power law that you would fit to this would actually give a, uh, a diverging number of hydrogen atoms in the universe. Um, so clearly there must be a cutoff at some column density that wasn't probed uh, in these early days with the statistical power of Sloan uh, and say over 100 systems, it became clear uh, that around a few times 10 to the 21, there was a break uh, in this, what is, a pretty, what, pretty, what is pretty well described by a single power law, a single diverging power law. Uh, there's a, a break on the order of a few times 10 to the 21. Uh, and uh, we are happy that we no longer have an infinite number of hydrogen atoms in the universe. Uh, modeling that frequency distribution, there's actually uh, I'd say a nice physical motivation, at least in the notion that this gas uh, takes on an, something like an exponential disk. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but uh, let's take that on SOTS for the moment. If we have an exponential disk uh, with a central surface density given by n perp zero, exponential disk, then the face on column density uh, will be just n perp times e to the minus r over rd, some scale length. Um, both Fall and Pei and Wolf. Uh, then went on to show uh, what the frequency distribution of randomly oriented disks would be under that onsatz. Uh, again, sticking with the face on, uh, our frequency distribution, bring it up so you can see it. Our frequency distribution uh, for face on then, uh, because, the, because we have a, uh, because it's an absorption line uh, survey and we're, we're sensitive to cross section in this experiment, that is where you have more area, you have more likely, uh, higher, uh, higher likelihood of the quasar lying behind, you, uh, behind that position. And for face on disks, the uh, area goes like the radius, it's proportional to the radius. Then working through that, you get that the frequency distribution, if you only had face on disks in the galaxy, which would be silly, uh, would look something like this, where NC is our, our usual co-moving number density, and the rest of this captures the, the physical AP that uh, I've uh, mentioned throughout. And then the last bit then is to um, allow for randomly oriented disks. That's the uh, conversion to randomly oriented. And finally evaluating, you would get something like this. Um, where for column densities less than that central surface column density, 
And you have this expression, and for common densities greater than it, you get an n to the minus 3 power law. Uh, for low values, values considerably less than the central, uh, this first term scales something more closely to n to the minus 2, which is a very good description of what I've shown you in the bind evaluations. And then, again, uh, you have a physical motivation for expecting a, a break at uh, this n perp 0 to an n to minus 3 power law. So in an ansatz of an exponential disk, you'd expect a broken power law. That turns out to be a pretty good model of the data. Here are the common densities. Here's the frequency distribution and a broken power law. Um, remarkably, this frequency distribution, uh, now shown as a cumulative uh, function, uh, shows very little evolution with redshift. So uh, with the, the Sloan surveys and beyond, we can uh, assess the frequency distribution, say, from redshift 2 to 5. Uh, all the different colored curves and style line curves are the cumulative integration of this frequency distribution. And uh, to within a few, at least 5 or 10%, they agree with each other. In addition, I'm showing in the red curve the frequency distribution of hydrogen gas in the local universe, again, dominated by uh, atomic gas in galaxies, and measured, in this case, by 21 centimeter observations, not from Limanoff absorption. And you'll agree that that is dead on with what was observed uh, roughly 10 billion years ago. So uh, the distribution of gas within galaxies today, in terms of their surface density as a population, as projected on the sky, which is how we observe it, is the same at redshift 0, uh, at least to within measurements, uh, as it is at redshift of 2. A bit bizarre, but true. Um, and all right, this is the evaluation from the, the full BOSS data set, where indeed an n to minus 3 uh, decline at the highest common densities is, is well favored. So I've said uh, there's very little evolution in the shape. How about the incidence of uh, the DLAs, this DLA gas? Again, L of x is just uh, uh, proportional to that. We measure L of x from our survey. And there it is at the bottom, not the top. And uh, like with the Lyman, the optically thick gas, we do see some uh, significant evolution over, uh, say, the redshift of 2 to 4, maybe a factor of 2 change in this product of NC and NP, uh, which again is a surprise. Uh, as I emphasized for the Lyman limits, uh, hierarchical cosmology predicts that the co-moving number density of source of halos uh, should be rising from around redshift 4 to 2, and then stalling. So uh, beyond redshift 2, perhaps you wouldn't expect much evolution in, the, in that NC. But from 4 to 2, for sure, in, in lambda CDM, uh, you expect a rise. And so this, again, runs contrary to that expectation of particle cosmology. And you have to invoke, and today I think we don't know uh, what the real answer is, invoke some kind of astrophysical process to decrease the amount of gas within or around galaxies as probed by DLAs. It could be phonization, although, uh, as I'll emphasize in a moment, or re-emphasize in a moment, th this gas is highly optically thick at the Lyman limit, so it, that seems a bit implausible. Perhaps it's got something to do, much more likely, it's got something to do with the processes of galaxy formation at this epoch, and uh, this is one of the, you know, this is kind of the key, or the dominant assembly epoch of galaxies, and uh, I suspect that is the answer at the end. Uh, looking to numerical simulations, uh, they're struggling uh, to match uh, these data. This is, I just kind of cherry picked one from the recent literature. Uh, here's this DNDX quantity I just showed you, this decre decrease in this uh, incidence uh, per absorption path length with redshift. And uh, all, the majority of the models being considered here all, again, predict a rise. Again, due to this increasing hierarchical cosmology of the halos. Uh, maybe there's one model that doesn't, but in that case, they've blown all the gas out of the galaxies. There's, there's no really no, not enough DLAs even to, to match the data. So um, you may get the evolution right, but doesn't get the normalization at all. Uh, back up to this. Uh, I, I showed you that the shape of the uh, H1 common density, the frequency distribution looks the same as the redshift zero, and uh, to within a factor of a little bit, uh, tens of percent maybe, uh, so too is the incidence. Okay, so uh, both the normalization and the shape of that frequency distribution is roughly the same today as it was uh, 10 billion years ago. 
Uh, OK. So uh, I like my swimming pool. Theory of galaxy formation. These days, I guess it's called the bathtub. Um, they're, they're marketing beat out over my simple toy model. It's fine. Uh, a way that I visualize what, uh, what could be going on here in terms of atomic gas within galaxies is you have your dark matter halos. That's the swimming pool. OK, uh, you create gas into these dark matter halos, fill it up with atomic gas, fine. And any additional gas that accretes into the system, and this is at the center of a, one of these so-called bathtub models, uh, any additional gas you create into the system will lead to star formation. Uh, in my case, fall out of the swimming pool. Um, and as you go forward in cosmic time, or as you, as you span across the universe, yes, uh, you continue to add, try to add water into the swimming pool, and it spills out as star formation. But the amount of atomic gas doesn't really change. It's, it becomes invariant uh, from a redshift of two when the dark matter halo distribution function is, is roughly constant uh, until today. So um, that, in principle, uh, may be what's going on uh, in terms of this constancy uh, over the last 10 billion years and the normalization, the amount and shape of uh, hydrogen gas within uh, the potential wells of dark matter halos. All right, I see that we're five minutes from when we, I should stop, so let's see. Yeah, uh, I think I'll skip that. Uh, suffice to say, well, let me just say it this way. I won't show the calculations. Uh, the H1 column densities we're talking about, 10 to the 20, few times 10 to the 20, imply op opacities or optical depths at the Lyman limit that exceed 1,000. Uh, that's highly optically thick, right, to the ionizing radiation. Uh, intuitively, we would expect that gas, gas to be neutral. Uh, we see that empirically. Uh, I put that in the notes, but I won't, I won't go through that. So uh, the DLA gas, uh, both from theoretical expectation and from direct uh, or somewhat indirect uh, observations of metal ions indicate that it's, it's, it's neutral. Uh, and we may, and I think I'll stop after this, take a census of the H1 mass density in the universe uh, from this gas. So define rho H1 to be the mass density and hydrogen atoms per co-moving megaparsec, akin to, say, rho star, which would be the co-moving mass density in stars at, per co-moving megaparsec. Um, it's historically been written as the, you know, normalized by the critical density and as omega H1. I, I prefer rho H1. Uh, that's straightforward to evaluate from our frequency distribution. We just sum up all the H1 column density weighted by the, the frequency distribution and uh, weighted by the mass of the proton. You could include a correction term for helium if you were interested. Uh, before showing the answer, I'll emphasize uh, that this distribution, this integral, is dominated by the highest comp density gas. No surprise given we've weighted by the comp density. But almost all the mass is in this, this DLA range of beyond a few times 10 to 20. Uh, I'll also emphasize that the calculation makes no reference uh, to the origin, nature, size, et cetera, of what DLA gas is. All right, we're just taking up, in a very empirical way, uh, the frequency distribution of this gas, its H1 com density, and integrating that across uh, the cosmic time. So no matter how the gas is distributed, the quantity we measure is independent of the size, shape, nature, whatever, uh, of, the, of the material. Um, here is that quantity. Uh, measured across cosmic time uh, from the Sloan survey, from a dedicated Gemini survey, estimations from the 21 centimeter. And as Earth order, maybe the takeaway message here is how, uh, again, how small the evolution is. It's talking about a factor of two in that, in the H1 mass density over 12 billion years or so of the universe. Um, since redshift of five, there's been about as much hydrogen gas in collapsed neutral form uh, as we see today in our, our, in our modern galaxies. And that's, again, an indication that uh, the atomic gas is not uh, what's dominating the, the star formation history. It's, it's, it's the reservoir for, out of which we form stars. But clearly, there's accretion uh, must be taking place in the galaxies to drive the star formation rates history that we see of the universe. Mm. And I got All right, so I'll pause. I think I'll stop there so we don't have to kill ourselves to get to the bus. And uh, I'll just show a few slides about associating DLAs to galaxies at the start of the next lecture uh, tomorrow morning, I guess. Thanks. <laughs>